Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for the kind invitation. It's wonderful to be here. What I'm going to do today is to tell you about uh, our recent attempts to develop more effective treatment for persistent Lyme disease. So I'm going to start with an overview of the complexity of the Lyme disease and the bacteria that cause the disease and then tell you about the persistence problem of Lyme and uh, discuss the different uh, possible causes for PTLDS condition and then tell you about the work on Borrelia persisters, its mechanisms and the limitation of the current Lyme antibiotics at, uh, against such forms. Then I will use the TB treatment as a model for developing more effective treatment for persistent Lyme disease. As you will see, there's a lot of relevant similarity uh, in developing treatment for persistent Lyme. So then I will tell you about uh, our work on identifying drugs targeting Borrelia persisters, and then the use of the drug combination approach to more effectively uh, attack, target Borrelia persisters. And then tell you about our work on some essential oils that uh, show amazing activity against Borrelia persisters, and then tell you different uh, strategies for treating persistent Lyme and ending with uh, future directions. So uh, in this audience, uh, we all know that uh, Lyme disease is the uh, most common vector-borne disease in the U.S. and in Europe as well. In fact, I just came back from a trip to France where I was invited to talk about uh, uh, Lyme treatment. Uh, there I learned, in fact, in France, it's a significant problem as well, where 55,000 cases a year, that's equivalent to the, on the population basis, equivalent to the U.S. So it's a significant problem in Europe, in France as well. So there, there's a similar sort of a problem we're facing in the U.S., where we see the two different camps, and, you know, there are physicians who say that it's a really easy to cure, easy to diagnose, and the other, as we're well, all familiar, the persistent problem with the Lyme. So the disease, as you all know, is actually rather complex. It's a very heterogeneous disease. During the early stage of the disease, it's pretty simple. Pretty, uh, it's a localized EM rash, then developing into early disseminated form, then late disseminated arthritis, then PTLDS. So it's a continuing spectrum where the IDSA seem to focus mainly on the acute active phase of the disease, which is easy, relatively easy to treat. Uh, that can be taken care of easily by two to four week antibiotics. Whereas when the disease gets into the persistent phase, they don't respond very well to current Lyme antibiotic treatment with a single drug, doxycycline or moxicillin or cefuroxam. As we all know, the problem with the persistence in Lyme is that they don't respond very well to current Lyme antibiotic treatment, where it's about 10 to 20 percent of the Lyme cases don't respond well. Despite proper treatment with antibiotics, they continue to suffer from fatigue, pain, joint, mus uh, joint muscle aches, brain fog, etc. They're called the PDLDS, you all know. So there have been uh, different clinical trials, as we all know, where there are two types of trials, where one type of trial showed no, absolute no effect. The Klemner study, uh, which used uh, IV ceftriaxone for four weeks, followed by two months of doxycycline, compared with placebo control, see no effect in improvement in symptoms. Uh, then this uh, Brian Fallon study as well as uh, Lauren Krupp study showed that uh, IV ceftriaxone had some effect in improvement in symptoms, but it's not a cure. It's only a temporary improvement. Then the symptoms can come back. Then, of course, there's a more recent Dutch study where it showed this uh, has a very unusual study design. All patients treated with two-week IV ceftriaxone then divided into placebo or treated with doxycycline or this drug combination. 
where they saw no effect. Of course, all patients are already treated with two-week IV ceftriaxone, so they don't really have a proper control group. So it's uh, making the interpretation difficult. So in this Dutch trial, where then they so see no improvement, I think there have been uh, different reasons that can be responsible for this observation. One is that the type of drugs used. We now know that the current Lyme antibiotics don't work very well against Borrelia persisters. The second point is that whether the treatment length is sufficient enough for a persistent disease like a PTLDS condition. The other is the heterogeneity of the disease. When designing such clinical trials, it is critical that we design the trials properly. I have to really, because it's a, such a heterogeneous disease, then all these factors can affect the outcome of the trial results. So in future clinical trials, I know there being a lot of interest, like Dr. Horowitz, along with some other physicians, very interested in clinical studies trying the persistent drugs. I think it is great, and it's important that we design the trials properly. Uh, taking these three points into, into consideration, one is persistent drugs, the other is how long we treat, the other is patient heterogeneity. As you all know, that the current treatment don't work very well. There is no FDA-approved treatment for PTLDS condition. Patients try all sorts of treatment modalities. It's all over the place. They don't work very well. Uh, it's like a wild west. You see all kinds of treatments that, from antibiotics, herbs, uh, IV, Ig, uh, hyperoxygen, etc. So, what are the causes for the PTLDS condition? There have been different theories. One is the host response to dead antigenic debris. The other is autoimmune. The third is that host uh, is already has produced residual damage during the infection process so that uh, you know, it can be helped. The fourth theory is that due to co-infections with uh, Babesia or Bartonella, et cetera. Then the last is persistent infection. So in, f in fact, if you look at all this, there's a sign of persistent infection that's actually going through all these possibilities. Um, that is, this host response to antigenic, antigenic debris could well be due to viable but non-culturable forms, which Dr. Ambers talked about, as well as autoimmune condition. Uh, the Alan Steers group uh, published an interesting study where Lyme arthritis some patients with Lyme arthritis go on to develop rheumatoid arthritis. So this uh, Lyme infection can really turn into rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease condition. So this shows this chronic in inflammation, chronic infection can lead to autoimmune disease condition. So all these possibilities can potentially overlap. They don't actually exclude each other can overlap in patients. So the, organism, the organism that causes the disease is rather unusual. The Borrelia bacteria develop different morphological variants, starting from the spirochete, which we are more familiar with. But that may not be the most important form involved in disease pathogenesis. In fact, when it develops in the older culture, it changed from spirochete into round body forms, as well as aggregated microcolony form as a, when the culture gets older, gets into larger biofilm-like structures. These actually have implications in terms of response to antibiotic treatment as well as uh, disease pathogenesis. So these forms are much more difficult to treat, uh, mu much more tolerant to antibiotics and uh, more tolerant to host clearance by the immune system. So we actually can divide, we propose this new model called the uh, inoculum-dependent severity of disease. This is really to show that the PTLDS condition can be heterogeneous, can be complex, can be broadly divided into two types. One is type one, that is during the actual tick bite infection process, they can already introduce biofilm-like structures causing a persistent disease so that despite standard antibiotic treatment, you don't cure the disease, okay? That actually seems to correlate 
uh, well with some clinical observations. That is, even though the patient are diagnosed early, treated early, you don't cure them. Okay? It's most likely due to this, during the very infection process of the tick bite, the tick can carry very heterogeneous Borrelia bacteria population. When it's inoculated with biofilm-like structures, they can cause a persistent form of the disease that don't respond to current Lyme antibiotic treatment. So that's called the early development type. It's called the type 1 PDLDS. The other type is what we are more familiar with. That is, patient are infected, not diagnosed in time, not treated in time, then from early infection, develop into persistent late stage of the disease, then it's difficult to treat as well. So this is just like a cartoon to show you this early Lyme, sometimes it's actually easy when it's actually introduced with uh, maybe spirochete form uh, prim primarily that's easy to cure. Uh, it's just like a small, small carrots, right? But sometimes it's unlucky. You're inoculated with the large carrots like a biofilm structure and you can't really get it out. Then there have been different studies showing the persistence problem. As uh, we all know, that's being shown in mice, in dogs, in monkeys. And that then the organism get into this V, B, and C, which uh, Dr. Ambers talked about. It's a really intriguing phenomenon, very interesting. They show, and also, in human studies as well, there have been anecdotal reports of culture of Borrelia organism despite treatment. But the intriguing thing is that it's not a consistent observation. It's unlike uh, TB, persistent infection. When the patient relapses, you can see the organism. You can culture the organism. But oftentimes with Borrelia, with Lyme disease, even though the patient relapses, you cannot culture the organism. That's why making the disease very difficult to diagnose very, and very easy to deny. Okay? So we need better diagnostic tools and also better treatments for such condition. So we and uh, Kim Lewis group, uh, Monica Amber's group, we all showed that Borrelia in vitro form persistors tolerant to current Lyme antibiotics. So current Lyme antibiotics are good at uh, killing or inhibiting the growing form of the Borrelia bacteria, but have a very limited effect on this stationary phase bacteria. So this is just some background on bacterial persistence. It's not, it's not new. The has uh, been observed when penicillin was first uh, introduced. It was found that penicillin killed 99% of the bacteria. There's also small, always small percentage of bacteria that's not killed. These small percentage of bacteria not killed, it's not due to genetic resistance, but rather due to phenotypic resistance, because when you remove the antibiotic, bacteria grow, remain susceptible to the same antibiotic. That's why it's called a phenotypic resistance. So we use this yin yang model to express this. So it's really easy to understand there are two types of resistances. One is the resistance in growing bacteria. That is what we are familiar with, genetic resistance, has a genetic basis. The other is resistance in non-growing bacteria in this dark part, in this non-growing persistent form. It's called persistence. Okay. So here, in fact, uh, people know persistent bacteria, persistent bacteria, important in, involved in persistent infections like TB, urinary tract infection, and I think in Lyme as well, as we will show you. So here I will use this TB treatment as a model for developing a more effective Lyme treatment. So, yeah, in fact, Borrelia developed persistors. There's a molecular basis. So we have done RNA sequencing of Borrelia persistors and showing that, in fact, uh, some pathways are upregulated. Very interestingly, the protease, uh, clip P protease, are upregulated along with DNA repair, etc. And uh, these pathways, in fact, share similarity to persistor pathways in other bacteria. In addition to these upregulated pathways, there's also, uh, you know, chemotaxis, transporters, all upregulated. There have been membrane, outer membrane proteins downregulated, and also ribosome proteins downregulated. 
So here, this TB treatment uh, regimen, which is a drug combination with four drugs, azanazid, rifampin, parazenamide, plus ethambutol for two months, followed by a continuation treatment with INH, azanazid, plus rifampin for another four months. So in the TB treatment, the model is that you have three types of drugs. One is type of, like azanaz that kills the growing form of the bacteria. Then you have rifampin that kills both growing and non-growing bacteria. Then you have a parazenamide, PZD, that kills exclusively the non-growing persister form of the bacteria. You need all three types of drugs in combination in order to more effectively cure persistent infection like TB. And in Lyme, we need exactly the same sort of approach. So in TB, in fact, people actually have learned all the lessons. That is, they know that uh, the importance of drug combination in the old days because they have 60 years of experience treating TB. So they know the importance of drug combination because in the old days, people know that if you just treat f with single INH as an as they give it the growing form of the TB bacteria, you get only 30% culture conversion if you treat for three months. And then if you use combination of streptomycin plus INH, you get a higher percentage of culture conversion to negative in, in the sputum. Then they also show the importance of the length of the treatment. That's also very important in developing a treatment regimen. You have to know how long you treat. In the old days, treating TB with three drug combinations, INH, PES plus streptomycin, takes two years to cure TB. Because if you treat a shorter time for a year, you get 19% relapse. If you treat for six months, you get 62% relapse, a very high relapse. That's why you have to treat sufficiently long. Okay? This was in the old days, in the 50s. Okay? But then, subsequently, TB people learned the lesson. Then they know the idea, the concept of persister drug. That is, when they found they add rifampin, which is a persister drug. Adding rifampin to this treatment regimen shortened the therapy from two years to nine months. And more importantly, when they add parazenamide, which is a true persister drug, to this regimen, you shorten the therapy from nine to 12 months down to six months. That is what we have. Without parazenamide, the therapy is longer. So that's why that all shows the importance of persister drug. So now in the TB field, we know. And, and then it's the same sort of a concept we need to extend to treatment of persistent Lyme disease. So this is the cartoon probably many of you have seen already. The current Lyme antibiotic is like this mower, which is only kills the growing, chop off the growing form of the bacteria. You still have the root there. And we will remove the antibody, if stop the treatment, the whole thing grows back. Uh, what you need is a shovel, like a persister drug, that dig out the root, then you cure the infection. So that's why we want to really apply the PZD principle, or yin-yang model, okay, to the treatment of persistent Lyme disease, where you need all three types of drugs, where you need the drugs like uh, doxycycline, that can be active against the growing form, and ceftriaxone is a drug that's interesting, that has activity against both growing and a non-growing form of Borrelia. Then we need persistent drugs like we identify like deptomycin, clofazamine, sulfur drugs, and all these. All these drugs have to be used in combination in order to more effectively cure the disease. So when we started, uh, there were no drugs active against uh, Borrelia persistent, so we have to develop a screen, cybergreen PI screen, we screen the FDA drug library and CI compound library. These studies have been published. I'm going to be very brief, very quick with this. In the first study, we identified the deptomycin, clofazamine, cefaparazone, sulfur drug, etc., active against Borrelia persisters. Then we published in the second paper, the, the more drugs, antiviral, antibacterial, etc., that have activity, antifungal as well. Then in CI compound library, come up with some, some interesting hits. Anthracycline antibiotic like donamycin, very powerful. It's anti-cancer, very powerful, active against Borrelia persistence, but because of its side effect, its use may be limited. Matamycin C less so. 
And then we also did the drug screen against the round body forms. So we came up with the drug hits very similar to what we found earlier, except we identified some additional hits like artemisinin, ciprofloxacin, sulfur drug as well. So this is actually the, the cyber green PI stain we developed that's better than the backlight uh, dead, live and dead staining, which Monica mentioned. Uh, this cyber green PISA allowed us to do high throughput screens and more importantly allowed us to rank the anti-persister activity of the current Lyme antibiotics in comparison to the persister drug candidates we identified. Among the current Lyme antibiotics, it's interesting to note that the cephalosporins are the most active ones. So the lower percentage, the more active the drug is. So interesting, tetracycline as well is more active than doxycycline. And uh, the, the macrolides not very active. And the, our persister drug candidates are very active, as you can see. So these are the, some of the other hits. I will not really go into the details because these are already been published, rifamycin, quinolone drugs, an antiviral, antifungal, uh, fluconazole, etc. cetera. Uh, not go into details. Important to point out that the anti-persister drugs are different from the current antibiotics active against the growing forms in that they may not have low MIC. They can sometimes have very high MIC, in contrast to the current Lyme antibiotics, usually have low MIC. That means very active against the growing form, but have no activity against persisters. And our drug candidate, persister drug candidates have high activity against persisters, but high MIC. That is, poor activity against the growing form of Borrelia. But of course, there are ones that are active against both forms, like donamycin, uh, cephalosporin. So these drugs, the persistent drugs, actually behave differently compared with other uh, drugs in that they seem to preferentially disrupt the cell membrane and inhibit the energy production, as well as uh, the essential oils that we found uh, seem to disrupt the cell membrane. And also the damaged DNA, um, like the donamycin, um, artemisinin, and et cetera. So we showed that even though we have the persistent drugs, we cannot use them alone. We have to use them in the context of drug combination. And it's, in fact, the triple drug combination, exactly like what I showed you earlier in the context of yin-yang. You need to take care of all three different bacterial populations in order to be more effective in eradicating these. So in the Cohen project, our goal is to identify drug combinations that are more effectively eradicate Borrelia persisters and uh, also develop this oral regimen that's easy to take because deptomycin, even though very powerful, is an IV expensive antibiotic. So then we go through these different processes. There are hundreds of thousands of different drug combinations one can test. How do we do it, right? So we have a rule that is according to this yin-yang model that is we have to, we know that we need all three types of drugs and we need to include persister drug candidates. So with these then, the idea is to really simplify the current treatment to something like this so that you get a three drug, three or four drug combination to take care of the persistent Lyme disease. So this is just uh, some inter interim results where we found that you need the different drug combinations. We came up with a range of uh, promising candidates uh, like uh, cefiroxin plus uh, ciprofloxacin plus some other drugs. Uh, these, of course, are in vitro studies, okay. So then we need a proper animal models, but I will come back to that. During the process, we also evaluated some essentials. They came up with very high activity against Borrelia persister. For example, oregano oil, cinnamon, cinnamon bark, clove bud, they show amazing activities. In the second study, yeah, this first one was published a year ago, amazingly has more than 60,000 views. So there's a lot of interest in the use of essential oils. So the second study actually identified additional hits like garlic, allspice, myrrh, hadecam, litsi, kubica, etc., as having very good activity in sporadic persisters. 
then here it's uh, comparing two different approaches for treating persistent Lyme. One is pulse dosing, the other is drug combination. In fact, uh, both seem to attack a uh, different type of bacterial population. With pulse dosing, work only with cephalosporin cytoantibiotic, not working with uh, static antibiotic agents, and then seem to be active against the minor form of the persistence, but for really biofilm-like structures, you can't rely on post-dosing. You have to use drug combination without post-dosing. So then so the animal studies right now is ongoing. Then the only problem with the current mouse testing, the model takes almost two years, it's not very efficient. Then we recently developed this arthritis model uh, that works in about uh, five weeks. So as you can see here, this show nice uh, sw swollen uh, in the joints. So we're currently using this arthritis model to evaluate different drug candidates more effectively. So for the future then, I think we really need to develop a persistent drug regimen that predictably cure Lyme disease rather than get them into remission. Okay? The, goal is to cure, use the C, C word. I know it's not easy, but I think there is hope, there is promise if we follow up on this type of approach. So for the future, I think we can use this two-type, two-tiered approach. One is potentially the, still the IDSA single antibiotic treatment that seems to work in the, about 80% uh, also. Of course, the percentage may vary, but the other is to use the persistent drug regimen. Uh, which we're working on. The other possibility is that from the very beginning, one should really use a persistent drug regimen, that is a drug combination approach, so that we don't get a high percentage of uncured patients. So to move forward then, we need to really do clinical trials to properly evaluate the drug combination regimen with the persistent drugs, I need to identify biomarkers for treatment response, need to address the role of co-infection and immune suppression, and above all, we need funding to do the work. And finally, I want to thank people who've done the work, our collaborators, Monica Ambers, Emir Hotzik, and the many physicians who have helped provide the good advice. And above all, I want to thank Cohen Foundation for providing the generous support for the work. Thank you.